Welcome to another edition of the Gazelle School of Business. Gazelle School of Business exists to cover every topic you can imagine related to building and running a piano service business. And in this week's webinar, we are talking about Pianoscope, a new tuning app that is changing the way technicians are learning aural tuning skills and combining it with ETD skills in their day-to-day -day life. In your business, one of the best things you can do is be confident in your skills. And we're excited to introduce you to Pianoscope as you see the opportunity to visualize your piano like never before. We hope you enjoy this and we look forward to seeing you at another Gazelle School of Business soon. All right, well, welcome to a special edition of Gazelle School of Business. And we are really excited to have Frank Illenberger here from Pianoscope. Uh, he is joining us from Frankfurt, Germany. And one of the reasons that we are really excited to introduce Frank and Pianoscope and just uh, ETD and aural tuning skills to the Gazelle School of Business is because one of the best things you can do as a technician is just to be confident in your skills. And if there's a part of your skill set, whether it's you or you're training somebody new or young that you need to get up to speed quickly, you know, you need to have good tools for being able to do that. And most technicians go through the life fighting in harmonicity in one way or another. And we just imagine what's going on behind the spinning lights of the ETD, but we never actually get to see in real time the full acoustic potential of each note that we're working with as it relates to the rest of the piano. And as a technician, you shouldn't have to settle for guesswork. And I know as a RPT myself that there are a lot of options out there for tuning apps. I've used many of them and I've promoted and supported many of them and I probably will my entire life. But we think you will quickly see how Pianoscope is changing the landscape of how the next generation of piano technicians are going to learn higher level aural tuning skills and voicing skills from day one of their journey as a piano technician uh, using tools like Pianoscope. So whether you're personally looking to learn these skills or seeking to train technicians, we're excited to have Frank here. Frank, welcome. Welcome, thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me, Tim. Absolutely. You know, I wanted to, just before we jump into the nitty gritty of how Pianoscope works and the features you've got, can you rewind the clock for us back to March of 2020? And tell me the story that you told me in LA where we met you at the PTG National Convention, uh, just about your experience with the COVID lockdowns and how that led to Pianoscope today. Yes, for sure. Um, it's funny because I'm, I'm not a piano technician. I, I'm a pianist. I have been playing piano uh, my whole life, but um, I'm, I'm a physicist by training and I've been developing project management software um, that's that's my main business for for 20 years and um, when uh, here in germany in march 22 we had the first uh, nationwide covid lockdown um, i thought oh i'm now having a lot of spare time to practice the piano and uh, i sat down on it and it just sounded terrible because i'm i'm living in an old brick house from the 1880s and uh, it had lots of swings in humidity uh, over the seasons and uh, I only have a rented piano, a, a fine instrument, but it's not mine and I couldn't install a lifesaver in there to balance the humidity. And I had to tune it like three or four times a year, not, not myself, I always had a, a professional technician for it. And at the time I couldn't get one because you weren't allowed to and the people wouldn't come to your home because nobody know what the virus was like at that point. And um, I, I couldn't stand the sound anymore of that instrument and I, I thought, oh, there is a do-it-yourself video for everything on the internet, just check it out uh, if I can do it myself. And um, I remembered an article from a German physics professor who had uh, written about that there's a sophisticated algorithm on how you can tune uh, a piano with electronic devices. And um, he has a software on it. it. I don't know if you, perhaps somebody knows them. It's called Entropy Piano Tuner. It's a free software on the App Store. And I thought, oh, that's exactly the thing I need. I, I ordered the, the cheapest tuning hammer, hammer on Amazon and downloaded that software. And um, 
it's a painstaking process of measuring everything. It takes <clears throat> a lot of time and I started tuning and uh, it took me a couple of hours, like four hours to, to go through there. And uh, it sounded terrible. It was <laughs> worse than before. And it was so terrible that I wouldn't even let my, my son do his practice for his piano lessons on it. And at that night I was exhausted and I went to bed and I thought, what story should I tell a professional piano tuner the next time he comes to my home to explain this <laughs> state of this instrument? Uh -huh. And um, the next morning I thought, oh, now it's, it's completely uh, uh, broken anyway. I could try again. Perhaps I can analyze what, what, what was my mistake. And, uh -huh. I read some some articles, watched videos, and I thought the only thing to blame could be the software. It couldn't be me. <laughs> and, uh, that is a I, true statement. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Sure. Not, but that's hilarious. But I think so you so went at it a second time. Yeah, and, and I tried. Then I started looking. Are there other so is there, are there other apps for that? I didn't know anything about it. I went to yeah, the app yeah. store and I found a couple of apps, but they were very expensive. Yeah. And I chose the, the, the cheapest one at the time that was TuneLab and I uh, bought it and installed it. And uh, I, was, um, I was amazed at what this software appeared like because I, I didn't get it. It looked like an ATM from the 80s, this, this user interface, and I had absolutely no clue how to use it. And I read through all the manual and it took me some days and watched some videos and YouTube. But I, I finally managed to finish a tuning after again four four hours tuning on it. And indeed it sounded nice. It was not perfect, but it was very playable. Mm -hmm. And I thought, yeah, I'm confident with myself. I, I learned something new. And at that night I was exhausted again, we were lying in bed and I, I started thinking, Perhaps they need competition. Perhaps with, with my experience in software and user interface design, I could improve on that, on, on that experience. And this is what infected me with the piano tuning virus from that day. <laughs> and, uh, as it turned out, it, it took me over a year to figure out all the algorithmic details, solve all the puzzles that, that were there. And um, at first, I, I wanted to write an app for people like myself, like um, uh, musicians that are daring to, to tune their pianos on their own. And this was, this was my focus. And um, I developed the app like that. And, but as I wasn't a professional, I needed a professional opinion on it. And I went to the, uh, the, the Piano World Forum and the Internet, put my app uh, there and said, oh, guys, I have a beta version of an app I'm developing. There's a, a professional piano tuner section on there. And I asked them, please give me honest feedback. Do these tunings sound good? Uh, is it any worth it? And uh, as it turned out, um, many of them liked the app and they gave me ton, tons of feedback on it. Um, and this, uh, they, on how to improve it for their needs. And that's when I started learning about what the needs are of professional piano tuners. And um, I started working with these experts uh, to find solutions for their problems. And uh, half a year later, um, I released version one to, to the freedom of the App Store. And um, this is where the, the journey started. Yeah. yeah, excellent. Well, it's been uh, interesting getting to hear your story because you went through a similar journey to what many piano technicians who wake up and decide, hey, how hard can it be to tune my own piano? And then we quickly realize, oh, there's a lot more to this than I thought, but you immediately jumped in using your skill sets straight into the mathematical analytical side of it um, and went through a similar learning process as well. Um, well, let's, um, let's dive in and I want you to just introduce folks to this and just kind of walk them through the various parts of the app. Um, and I'm going to be moderating the Q&A here so if you have questions, there's going to be intervals kind of throughout this uh, demonstration where we will have you raise your hand um, and I'll unmute your mic if you want to ask a question or if there's a Q&A question button at the bottom, 
you can click that and Luke Erisman is with us. He's behind the scenes. He's going to be moderating the Q&A. Uh, so drop your questions either in the Q&A or raise your hand and we'll be sure to get to you. Uh, but Frank, uh, I'll turn the reins over to you here. Okay, thanks. So let me share my screen to show you some slides. Um, here we go. Yeah, so uh, this is how I got in, into piano tuning. Um, and I've been selling this software now for over a year and I learned a lot. Um, but, but what did I learn about why do people need another professional tuning app? Because I think that there currently is a mismatch in how we use our existing tools. Um, because at the core of it, nobody deserves to show up at a client's house only to discover that he didn't bring the right tools to the job. Um, but it, it's not only enough to have the right tools, you also need to have the confidence in how to use them. And um, your ears, what about your ears? They Aren't they a tool as well? You always bring them too to your job. And um, we all have ETDs, but do we always understand what is going on behind, behind the scenes in them? Um, that's what I try to achieve with Pianoscope because it's, that's why I chose the name. It's, it should be just like with a microscope. You can virtually gaze inside an instrument and use and compare its visual feedback with, with what you're experiencing orally. And with time, it helps you to gain confidence in your skills and to even start understand pianos better. And um, uh, as you all know, there's a debate about oral tuning versus ETD. And in Germany, we have that too. And it's only here, it's just starting. It's the same discussion you already had uh, 20 years ago in the US. And, um, but what's the reason for that, that debate? I think deep down people know that they cannot outsource 100% of their job to a machine without having any risk. And the risk is that there are consequences that come from not knowing how to use your ears. Yeah. And um, for example, you could encounter that one piano that breaks all the rules, that surprises you, that uh, leaves you dumbfounded when you, you stand before it. And um, let's start to, to uh, illustrate that, what it means by a, a, a nice feature that's a very small feature inside Pianoscope that I developed for myself when I try to understand what piano tones are made of. Um, because when I started, I didn't know anything about you know, everybody has to listen to partials in a, in a tone, you can hear the whole sound or, and you or you can dissect it. And um, when I started, I did not know that many bass notes are lacking all the lowest partials. I found it amazing that our brain gives us this pitch illusion, although the, 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 uh, the lowest partials aren't there something in our brain reconstructs the missing partials. And I found that so amazing that I wanted to see it. And over time, I found that piano technicians like this feature a lot because it helps them develop more confidence in what, what they are hearing. And uh, let me show you a, a, a demo of this. Um, where are we? So this is Pianoscope now running on a, on, on a simulated device. I don't have an actual device here because it's, it's easier for demoing. You're just imagining it's an, it's an iPhone that's, that's running on. And for now, we just ignore what's up here. We just focus on the, on, on the lower part. And I'm going to play a, a recorded note of a... Um, of a, uh, a single string, like a muted unison, where you only have a single sounding, sounding string. And look. And what you're seeing here, oh, uh, it's uh, when I start talking, it, uh, it disappears. But what you're seeing then, I repeat it again, is, um, is the uh, actual partials that are in, a, uh, in there and the, the relative strengths of them. Um, those partials are um, assigned to musical notes. 
so you see which partial belongs to which node. What you see here is a frozen state like the maximum peak of every partial and you see there are soft ones like the, the first partial here or the eighth partial and there is the dominant one, the second one uh, here and they are in relation to each other. But you cannot only freeze it, you can put it into live mode and say what the dynamic between the partials is. Let's take a different note. And um, let's go back to the freeze mode. Turn this off. And you cannot only um, look at the partials in this mode, but you can. What I do behind the scenes is I record every partial, and you can play it in back in isolation. And uh, you just tap at one of the bars, like for example the third partial or the fourth, it's softer. And when you do that and you replay the sound, you can identify the role of the partial in the whole sound. And it's very easy and approachable to, to do that. Um, yeah, and Frank, one of the one of the things that struck me the first time I saw this in action and the first time that I played it actually on a piano was I realized that I spent so many years of my early days as a technician trying to visualize what you just visualized for me. Um, and I can't tell you how many times I got to a piano where I felt like I, I couldn't hear the partial I needed, only to realize lit much later in life that as the note bloomed and decayed, um, as piano scope shows on a lot of notes, the partial you need actually dips low or is not dominant. And it was so helpful um, having it that way. Uh, we're gonna take, Frank, unless you had a little more to show on the aural part of this, um, did you wanna take a few questions about just kind of aural skills and aural tuning and how it interfaces with piano scope or did you have a little more you wanted to show on this? I can show just a, a few more bass notes with a lot of partials okay. and then I can, can take some questions. Yeah, yeah. So sure. if you have questions on either oral tuning, uh, go ahead and raise your hand. All right, uh, let's see here. Daniel, how are you this evening? What's your question? I'm good, how are you? Doing well. I. Uh... I have only ever tuned orally. Um, I've never used an ETD. I did all my training orally. It was, it was kind of grueling. Um, I've come to discover recently that I'm probably not, I could probably definitely refine my skills. I want to stay an oral tuner, but I'm definitely intrigued by finding an ETD that will help me improve my skills. So how can your product, I lost my train of thought. Well, how can your product help me with, with, with that, with improving my yeah. oral skills? That, that's a good question. Um, Frank, I'll let, I've got some thoughts on that as well, just as a technician sure. who's been on both sides of that, but I'll let you jump in there. Um, actually, this is the main topic for, for tonight. Um, I have lots of uh, examples on this and if, if you just stick with the flow, uh, I think your question should be answered. So if you still have a question on that, perhaps put it afterwards because I think otherwise I would repeat or everything uh, on that. So there will be a lot of for you to see yeah. on this. Yeah. And Daniel, I'll give you just kind of a quick take on it as well because I've been on both sides of that coin personally. Uh, the aural feedback loops that I have found inside Pianoscope are really tight. 
And uh, it allows me to pivot in between RL tuning and ETD tuning very quickly. Um, it used to be that I would either be RL or I would like do the shift in my brain and pull out the app and get everything going. And then I would look at ETD. But uh, when you don't have the RL components being displayed, uh, it is very dominantly the left side of your brain at play. And it's actually a fair amount of work to switch back and forth. So I, I just personally speaking, what I found was so helpful was that it engaged both sides of it because I could more quickly pivot back and forth between RL um, and ETD. Um, and then like Frank said, I think we're gonna address some of that um, throughout the webinar here. Uh, any other questions on RL tuning that you want us to address, just either how this works or how the partials work? or anything along those lines. Uh, raise your hand, otherwise we'll we'll continue on. Okay. We did have a question in the, um, in the oh. Q&A section. Um, yeah, perfect. Uh, Liz is asking, uh, have you tried using the partial visual visualization to aid in voicing? Yes, I'm actually gonna show, uh, it's the last topic for today. I'm gonna show how, uh, how it applies to voicing. Yeah, great question. All right. Uh, well, Frank, why don't you jump in with the uh, next part of the demonstration and I'll yes. let you take the reins. Um, go back to the slides. There we are. So as we've seen, visualizing partials, uh, your ears are your most powerful tool. And um, if you understand what partials are there in Node and which partials to listen to, um, then you will be able to train your ears to hear the right things. And um, yes, the next thing is uh, in harmonicity. And with Pianoscope, there is a way to visualize it. Um, what about in harmonicity? Um, we all know that the partial spectrum of piano tones is inharmonic. And um, to do their job, Every ETD needs to gather information about an individual instrument. Uh, where are the, where the uh, partials for different nodes are exactly. And um, from this information, they calculate the needed stretch and tuning curve. But to gather this information, there are different approaches, as you probably know, in, in uh, different ETDs. We'll come back to that later. But when I was working on them, I thought, if we have to measure this information, can we make a virtue out of this necessity? Or is it just uh, uh, something we have to do? And I think it's an opportunity to learn more about an instrument. And I can demo to this uh, at, as well. We can check out what the inharmonicity for, for different instruments look like. And for this demo, um, just as a change, I'm switching to an iPad on which uh, the software is running as well. Um, with Pianoscope, you have a tuning file for every instrument you're working on. It's just like a, a regular file. And I have pre-recorded different files of different instruments. Um, these are already recorded and um, we can open one of them. This is uh, where I have it. This is a Hoffman P162. These are um, metric uh, model numbers. So this is a small, very small grand piano. And what you're seeing here is the so-called inharmonicity chart in Pianoscope. Um, the inharmonicity is mapped to a number. For those of you familiar with the mass, this is the so-called Harvey Fletcher inharmonicity. It assigns a single number to uh, to a string, where zero means would mean a perfectly harmonic spectrum, like for a violin string. Um, but for piano strings, uh, they are much higher, and um, the number tells how spread out the, uh, the uh, partials are in a note. And what, do you, what, what is plotted here, you have the black dots. They indicate for every note how high the inharmonicity is. But the inharmonicity differences are pretty, pretty big in a piano. Therefore, we have like what we call a logarithmic scale. Like you have these horizontal gray lines. They indicate a factor of 10. So the lowest inharmonicity is here in the in the upper base and it goes up a factor of a hundred in the in the treble 
So this is what, what, what is plotted here. And um, the dots are the actual measurement of the instrument. And uh, the, the black line is like an, the curve an ideal scaling would have if you are like have the perfectly adjusted strings to each other, which in reality you only have on very, very expensive instruments. And what you're seeing here is this big jump uh, at the, the tenor break, where um, in this instrument you get a really big change in, in harmonicity. And you, before you even start tuning, when you, when you have a, a visualization of this, you know that this is a problem point of this instrument, or might be a problem point of this instrument. And it will reflect in your tuning curve you, you get in the end. Um, let's compare this uh, with uh, another instrument. I have a, a very small spinet upright piano here. And what you're That's seeing, wild. You, you see very wild swings of the, the inharmonicity here and a very high inharmonicity in the bass. The, the, the low bass in harmonicity is as high as the one of C5. This is because the strings are very, very thick and short in, 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 the, in the bass for this, this instrument. Um, we can have a look at uh, another one. This is a, a Bechstein 212. This is a, a medium-sized grand. And uh, what you're seeing here is that they achieve a very low bass in harmonicity for this single note here, which is exceptionally low. But what you get for this instrument, because it's, it's medium sized, once you reach the lower bass, the instrument isn't large enough. So they have to rapidly increase the thickness of these strings and you get a very, very steep increase in, in harmonicity to the to the lower bass much steeper than than in all the other stuff and this will strongly affect the stretch in, in in this region and you get wild jumps as here as well even though it's a very very uh, good instrument and um the end we could at the upper end we can look at a shigeru kawai grand piano and uh, here you see that it pretty much nails it. Um, it's all the measured notes are pretty much at the ideal. So with this instrument, you won't have any problem finding a, a good tuning. It's very, very easy to tune. And uh, you, you see that right away when you look at, uh, at the measurements. So this is, um, we will, I will show you later what that means for the tuning curves and how, how it will, uh, how it will affect them. But this, uh, should be enough for this uh yeah frank um if, if anybody has any questions about inharmonicity or just sure. kind of visualizing it and how to make decisions about that with the piano you're looking at in front of you um can, were you going to show now how you measured each note of inharmonicity or this will be the, the the next section but the if there section, are any okay. any questions on on what i sh just showed we can can have yeah. them here. uh does anybody have any questions that you want either Frank to go into more detail with or on inharmonicity or how to use it. Um, and it looks like we have us here indeed. Uh, how can I, oh, um, uh, looks like Luke is answering those questions. Okay, great. Yeah, let's, um, let's move on then and talk about um, just measuring each individual piano and- Yeah, okay, just, just a okay, short, short recap, recap here. here. Um, if you, the visualization of the, the inharmonicity helps you because if you know exactly where the problem spots are in an instrument, you can make better tuning decisions. And um, the benefit of Pianoscope is that it shows you the problem spots even before you tune a single note. And I have some customers who only use Pianoscope not for tuning, but for inspecting the, the evenness of the scaling of an instrument. And um, so this is a, another point of using the software. So let's, uh, what does it look like if you want to sample all the notes? Um, how many notes do, you, do we need to measure? Um, in my examples, we have seen that I measured all the notes. And, but as you probably know, some ETDs only measure a few notes. Um, 
most famous one is cyber tuner. It measures all the A's, very tuner measures all the C's. And I think for well-made pianos, you can get away with sampling only, only a few notes. And with Pianoscope, you can do that too. But for cheaper pianos, this won't always work because um, the inharmonicity for all the notes you don't measure is estimated. And as we have seen, uh, things can be very surprising around the bass antenna breaks. And if you miss those surprises, the ETD will calculate an unsuitable tuning curve. And um, when I was starting uh, on tuning, I, uh, I had something that drove me crazy because on my instruments, I have a couple of bass unisons where the strings have different inharmonicities in a single unison. And um, if you have such a unison, as you know, um, you, you always will have some beating because uh, no matter how you tune them, uh, you, uh, you will always have a mismatch. And this drove me cr crazy when I started because, oh, what am I doing wrong here? And, and uh, when I started analyzing and measuring the inharmonicities, I said, oh, this, this can't work. Yeah, this, it's just not possible to, to do that. Um, but with, so it's, it's a good thing to measure all the, all the notes. Um, uh, but the biggest hurdle there is it takes time and it has to be fast. And, uh, with other apps, it sometimes takes ages just to measure all the A's. Uh, and, um, I know, knew I had to Im improve on that and I can show you, show you what it, what it looks like and what the process is in Pianoscope. So let's go back to, so when you start with a new instrument, you just create a new document. You can enter stuff here about the instruments. We just skip that. And uh, the first thing the app prompts you to is to measure the inharmonicity. You press a, press a button and you're good to go. And I'm going to play recorded uh, notes here um, from, a, from a Yamaha upright piano and we we'll see what, what the process looks like. So for the rest, I want uh, got to play um, only the notes of a triad because now we have all the interesting part and the treble won't be uh, that surprising. So, and you don't, uh, you don't need the rest. 
um, because the inharmonicity of the last octaves doesn't play any role because their second partial lie, out, lie outside the range and don't um, affect the tuning curve. So now we're done. Um, I think it took about two minutes uh, to record this, what we're seeing here, and it's about the same time you need to record all the A's in another software because you have to repeat them all over again. So you're pretty fast to get a complete picture of the inharmonicity. Um, so how can it be that fast? Well, what's, what's the secret sauce? And I think it's that I'm focusing on the first second of the tone. Because um, I'm thinking when you hear mu piano music, what part of a note are you hearing the most often? It's the first second or the first half second because most of the notes are short. Why should I measure anything else? All the information is there in the first part. And um, that's where I'm not recording long swaths of, of notes. Um, and I made the, the user interface fluent that it, it guides you immediately to the next note. You can skip notes. You don't have to click anything. It's very, very fast to do. So spending two minutes for, for every instrument and you have to only record it once for an instrument. And if you have like consistent batched instruments like Yamaha uprights where you have the same model all over again, you can even reuse these documents and don't have to remeasure them. Yeah. And it saves you time uh, later on. Frank, something you had mentioned to me early on, too, was just mathematically, when you're analyzing those tones behind the scenes as you were building this out, you realize that in that first one to two seconds of the tone, you had everything you needed mathematically to be able to predict all of the inharmonicity for the notes. Yes. And as you sample the note longer and longer, you know, it really didn't actually change mathematically the inharmonicity curves that you were finding. Actually, um, it, it does. The inharmonicity changes in the later part a bit of, of the note. But why should I base my tuning curve on the later part when it doesn't play a big role in the actual music you're playing in the end? Yes. So yes. that's why I'm Sorry, focusing I missed on that front. But yep. Um, and this is this is something I've had a lot of people reach out to me personally on since we announced this webinar. I mean, does anybody have any questions about uh, calculating in harmonicity or just some of the nuts and bolts of um, just uh, the way that Pianoscope is interacting with this? Because calculating that tuning curve really is one of the most important aspects of any ETD. Uh, so, does anybody have any questions on that? Um, and we're when measuring each note. Uh, are you measuring just one string or all the strings in the note? It depends. Uh, if uh, the unisons aren't strongly out of tune, you don't have to mute them. Because okay. in the end, they are all sounding together. And it's good if Pianoscope has like an average of both, because that's what's sounding in the end. But if they're strongly out of tune, like you have a lot of beating in, in a unison, then you have to mute one of them. Or okay. only is play it, one, one of the strings. Yeah, yeah. Is there a threshold uh, you would recommend on that? Um, if you work with it, you get a feeling because you get visual feedback. If you say the, 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 see the points jumping, f jumping a lot of time up and down, then you see you have a lot of variation in that tone. Just play it two times, and you see if it if it alternates, then you should mute one of the strings. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then I could also theoretically, if I had a note that was out of tune, I could play it, and then if I questioned if I needed to, I could just slip a mute in between the other two play it again, and if that note changes any, I know that the inharmonicity was affected by that. Yes, I, yeah, then you, you know you have, have different inharmonicity in two bass strings, for example. You can analyze it with that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, from Sophia, if a piano is wildly flat or sharp, does that affect the accuracy of the tuning file? Um, the, if, uh, if you pitch raise a piano, you change its inharmonicity, you lower it with it. It's about 1% every 10 cents you raise a piano. So the measuring accuracy of piano scopes, the measuring error is about 2 to 3%. So if you're just raising a piano by 20, 30 cents, you don't actually have to remeasure the inharmonicity. If you pitch raise more, 
you if you then do the fine tuning, you will have to remeasure it once. Okay. Yeah. Um, and how how let's see here. I've got I'm gonna stick on this question of the out of tuneness and I'm gonna come to your question, Stephen. Uh, how far out of tune can the piano be and still get a good inharmonicity measurement? You mentioned, you know, anything less than 20% or 20 cents flat. And yeah, you're probably inside that range. Um, do you have any guidelines on that? No, the measurement is always good. It gives, it gives you the inharmonicity the string has right now in that state. It's always, the measurement is always good. Yeah. It's another question if you can use this in harmonicity to do the final fine tuning for it. And yes. this is what I said. If if you pitch raise more than 20, 30 cents, I recommend remeasuring the yeah. inharmonicity yeah. the second time. Perfect. And then uh Steven is asking how this compares with Cybertuner's new AI mode of measuring. Um it's faster. Um, the I, I, I mode in, in CyberTuner, they don't measure all the nodes, they me measure most of the bass and parts of the treble, so this is quite similar, but it still takes much longer time in CyberTuner to do that. And I don't know how, pe how many people are actually using it because of that, or if they just stick to measuring all the A's, because they still have that mode in, uh, in there as well. I, I don't know, I don't have any experience how, how it is. Yeah. Yeah, and this was actually a conversation you and I had prior to the webinar, um, just as I was trying to understand what the differences were as well. And in a lot of ways, uh, it seems like the AI mode in the CyberTuner, the more notes that you sample to get the tuning is exactly what you you were doing all along anyway. Um, and so it really just gets down to the function of it. They're doing the exact same thing. You're just extending that all the way up the piano um and taking advantage of the fact that you can quickly sample each note okay. um in there uh patrick asks uh, if you can describe your pitch raise mode um is this something you were planning on covering in this section um i have it for a later section um okay that's fine we're going to come back to, to that trisha uh, uh i'm sorry um one moment uh, let's see here. Do, do, do. Somebody mentioned uh, CyberTuner only measures 30 notes and it takes longer to measure. Uh, can the software tell you how much to raise each note when doing a pitch raise like VeraTuner? Is there an overpull? Uh, I think you're probably yes. going to cover that. Okay. Um, and then Steven said, I do get lazy and not use the AI mode unless I'm tuning a very high end piano. Uh, interesting. Uh, what from what you were telling us earlier about in harmonicity, um, Frank, is you actually need that AI mode more in lesser quality pianos. Yes. Um, and pianos with those steep curves, whereas you might get away with it more in a high quality piano. Did I hear that correct? Yes, that's correct. But I don't know the the, the details of CyberTuner's uh, interpolation algorithm okay. for, for estimating the not not measured nodes. I don't I don't know the details. So yeah, yeah. I don't know the error they are, they are, they are making. Okay. Um, all right. Um, great. Well, uh, if there's no other questions, um, let's move on to the next segment. Yes, and this is uh, about tuning stability. Um, in the end, if you don't achieve tuning stability um, when tuning, nothing you do on the piano matters because the strings won't go and stay where you put them. And um, this was, was one of the hardest parts for me as a, as a novice coming into that because I asked everybody, uh, what do I have to do so that my tunings get stable? And I read some textbooks on it. And um, I'm a physicist by training, and I wanted to understand what's happening there. And uh, everybody I was talking to gave me some esoteric concepts about uh, setting the pin and, and all these, these concepts, and they didn't make any sense to me. But what I learned is that there are people who have many different techniques of achieving stability, and they have trained lots of um, muscle memory for it, how to, how to achieve it, how to achieve this. But the constant to all this is that you need reliable feedback when you want to learn that to tell if your technique is working at all when you work on that. And uh, this is what I try to achieve with Pianoscope. And um, with such a um, tuning device, you have to look for hours at that. You work on many instruments a day 
And so it has to adapt to your needs. And in, in my work with uh, technicians, I've learned that one size doesn't, does not fit all. There are so many w different ways at uh, approaching tuning. Um, some people tune very slow and gentle and some are extremely fast. And I had a, a piano technician from Israel who wrote uh, to my support email and said I had a bug in my software because uh, it did not react to notes in the high treble. And I thought, how, how can that be? For me, it was working fine. And I uh, then asked him to record what, what he's doing with the piano. And he sent me a recording and that guy was tuning with an extreme high stroke frequency in the high treble. He stroke a key like seven, seven, eight times a second. Dang, 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 dang. And um, for, for my software, it was only hearing hammer noise and not, not listening to the actual, actual uh, tones. And uh, I thought, oh, if I want to support that guy, I have to think about filtering out the hammer noise more and getting to that. And I worked with him to, to fit his needs. So I know there are different tuning techniques out there. And um, perhaps I can demo what the feedback looks like in uh, Pianoscope. Now we're going to switch again to the iPhone. And again, I'm going to play pre-recorded notes to show you what the tuning interface looks like. Let's get rid of the partials first. Um, Pianoscope has two different indications for the current pitch you're on. Uh, one is an indicator in that scale you're seeing up here. And this scale shows you the tuning target in the middle, where you want to be. And if the red indicator is right from that, you're sharp. And if you're left from that, you're flat. And the scale is not linear. You see in the middle, you have a very, very high accuracy of only one cent. And yeah, you can really discern like a, a two hundredths of a cent, a cent there if you're, you're very, very fine. And on the outside, you have a an accuracy of like 50 cents per centimeter. And so you don't have to switch scales to, um, oh, sorry, those simulators have their problems. You don't have to switch between uh, scales from switching from coarse to fine tuning. You can do it all in, in one scale. So what does it look like? Let's play an A, a G4. Here you see the indicator very close to the tuning target. I'm going to vary the pitch now. You see the small, when once we're very close to zero, you see the tiniest fluctuations that you're hearing in the sound. You see it in the indicator as well. But the indicator is still calm, not jumping wildly around. around. You, uh, and you, um, if you don't want that fluctuation, there's a setting in uh, in piano scope where you can say say I want the responsiveness to be very slow. And then you see those variations are averaged out. And you can even make it if you say no, I want to see everything the string does, you can say oh make the responsiveness very fast. And if you listen closely, like you all do, you will see that the, the string does the same in your ear. And so you can use that to, uh, to, uh, for, your, for your training as well. Um, the default setting is, uh, is a medium responsiveness like, like we've seen be before. And what you're seeing is that um, Pianoscope automatically detects the note you're tuning. And is, I've 
spend a lot of time on making this detection very, very reliable. Because with other apps, when I started tuning it, it often happened that I was, for example, was tuning C4 and the apps thought it was a C3 and they gave me a completely different tuning target and looked at the at the partials which are in there the same partials but they should be somewhere totally completely different and it is if you don't don't uh, check this for every note you're tuning you end up with a completely broken tuning so i i knew that there mustn't be any octave errors in automatic note detection and i think i've nailed this with uh, with pianoscope so if you switch to different notes it will detect them but this will only work if your piano is not more than 50 cents flat. Then for sure it can't work because you, the information just isn't in the, in, in the note to discern it. There is a mode for that as well. You can switch off the automatic note detection and then just click the on-screen keyboard if you want to. Or you can get rid of the keyboard and use gestures, tapping gestures or swipes to navigate through, um, through the uh, different notes. And there are also chromatic modes uh, where you where it automatically follow, follows you upward, but but if you do checks like octave checks or twelfth checks downwards, it it, it won't react to it. So it, you have a, like a, a mixed mode as well if you want to. Um, but there is a, a second indication um, that many people are familiar with, and this is the strobe. You can activate uh, the strobe and you can have both indications together or only one of them. I sh let me show it. And if you're sharp, the strobe is moving to the right. The sharper you are, the faster. And if you're flat, it goes to the left. And the aim is to get it to uh, be uh, still. I sh I'm going to show this. This is the place where you reached your tuning target. And you see it's also a very calm interface and it's also highly customizable. Um, I like the strobe a bit in the background when I tune, therefore you can have like a medium contrast and give it, give it a soft contour and it looks like, has like a ghosty feel. can do that and I, or I had an Italian uh, piano tuner who said I, I always tune grand pianos and um, the tuning lever is always hiding one of these stroke bars what can I do against this and for him I, I, I constructed a setting where I can see oh just give me more blocks in there like give me five stroke blocks and left giving a medium contour and a high contrast And this solved the problem for him that, that uh, the, the, the blocks aren't covered. And I had a, another senior um, US uh, piano technician who told me um, the strobe is fine, but I only need it when I'm very close to the target. Otherwise, it's just noise for me and I, I want to rely on the indicator. And uh, we worked together and we came up with a way that you can say, oh, there's a threshold. And I say, I only want the indicator um, to be there um, once I reach, like, let's say, one cent to the tuning target. And uh, I do the same for the strobe. Put it also to one cent. And then when, when you're far away, get the indicator and the closer you get then the strobe takes over and so you see it's it's highly configurable to the needs you have um, there are lots of options here and I'm always try to uh, to improve it you can make the the indicator thicker if you're tuning from f further away and you want to see that you can make the scale um, yeah, if you want to, you can even hide the scale if you only only work with the with the strobe. And if you 
then even hide the keyboard, you get a very clean, clean user interface with not much clutter and distraction. So a lot of, lot of ways, and you can even automatically show the scale. Um, if you want to, where is it? Show it automatically. And then you get a scale when you're far away. And once you read the tuning target, it goes away and makes room for the stroke. And that's the way I try to, to be a, a good citizen for all the, the different tuning techniques that are, that are out there. So, yeah. so much for... Frank, we have a, a couple of questions. Can I jump into those quick or? Sure. Okay. Uh, Chris is saying that when he measures the inharmonicity using the app, he found that on small cheap pianos, it struggled to recognize which notes he was playing in the very bottom octave. Uh, is there a way to solve this that he's missing? Yes, that's, ah. that's pretty easy. There might, there might always be some notes that have funny, funny spectra. A0 is, is one of the candidates because uh, it's hard for the microphones of the, uh, of the small devices. But um, what you can easily do is just switch the automatic key selection to off and select the note you are tuning. And then Pianoscope is pretty resilient against background noise as well, because oh, this simulator still has a problem. It's uh, very resilient against uh, a background noise. And, okay. uh, because it only looks at the partials of that that note and uh, I'm, i can promise you it will recognize that note as well and if you really find a note that pianoscope doesn't recognize please make a recording for me and i will uh, improve that i uh, i didn't have that for a year now but um, i i it, it might always happen that there's a special sound a special string out there that has a fancy spectrum that i don't recognize yeah uh, another question is uh, going back to when you were talking about filtering out the hammer noise and the high treble. Yes. Um, have you worked any with trying to filter out noisy duplex noises uh, it, as, as you're focusing on the speaking length of a string for pianos where the duplexes are really noisy and difficult or interfering with what we're hearing? Um, yes, um, the most complaints I have is not about duplex uh, parts of the strings, but with the undamped treble, uh, treble strings that resonate as well. Yes, okay. And um, there are actually two solutions for that that work pretty well with, uh, with the customers. The first one is the one I showed you just for the, those notes that make problems with resonances, just switch to off mode and select okay. them manually. Works yeah. always perfectly, but it's it's a bit of work then to select the note, but it, you, you can do it pretty, pretty easily. And the other thing that uh, uh, one of my um, customers to taught me was if he's doing tuning a grand piano, he just puts a piece of cloth on, uh, on the strings and the problem solved. Yes. Yeah. Um, cool. Uh, Brent said, pretty cool interface. Uh, he said that he's found the iPad mini six has a better microphone or a slightly better microphone. Are there versions of iPhone where the microphone issues have been better or less? No, uh, I, that would affect in, experience? In practice, I don't know about any issues with microphones. Okay. Actually, they're, they're pretty up to uh, the test. Yeah. Um, uh, and then uh, somebody anonymously, I don't know who this was, but they said sometimes when tuning in the high treble, the keyboard jumps to the note an octave lower versus the actual pitch. Um, and he's noticed that in the high treble can sometimes be a little bit jumpy. Uh, and that, that seems like what you were just showing as well is if you're getting that jumpiness either in the low or the high, then just but, tap in and lock it to whichever. We, were we are talking about oral experiences as well, but if you tune that, that's the resonance you're hearing because you get the lower resonating notes as well. And that's what, uh, what Pianoscope is jumping to. The sound is actually there. Our brain is pretty good at ignoring these, these things 
um, because we are really able to focus on a thing. But um, for a, for an electronic device, it's hard to tell which of those two sounds you're hearing is the actual note you're tuning. And the solution is what I what I was talking about. Either put a cloth on the the undamped strings, then you get rid of the resonances, or lock on to the note uh, you are tuning. And then also another quick tip is Frank, if you blow the keyboard up, uh, especially on a small device. So if you just expand the keyboard. Um, it actually makes it a little easier to not fat finger the wrong note yeah. um, as you're working with it. And so you can just slide to whatever note, you know, zoom in, slide to whatever note you're on. There's a pinch. In. You can use the, the pinch gesture on it um, to, to make it larger or smaller. Yeah, um, I found that helpful too. And you can scroll, scroll through the keyboard. Yep. Um, okay, uh, let's see here. Uh, Kendall says, is it possible to tune in any sequence? For example, could you tune A to A and then proceed upward or downward from the temperament with RL checks without confusing the ETD? Yes. Um, the, um, we are, because we are measuring the inharmonicity in a separate pass before we start tuning, I have all the information. So you can tune in any order you want because everything is there. There are other um, apps like Veritune, for example, where you have to follow a strict sequence because it measures the inharmonicity as you go. And um, that's not the case with Pianoscope. That said, if you pitch raise, you have to follow a sequence because I have to predict the movement of the plate and the, and the soundboard. Uh, and, okay. um, Therefore, you have to tune from bottom to top in a, in, a, in a linear way. But if you're not pitch raising, you're free to tune in any order you like. And the key selection modes, chromatic up and down, help you to do checks um, without affecting the automatic note selection. And if you want to do crazy checks in all directions, just switch to off and you, you, you're good to go. Yeah. Uh, Jordan says, does the pitch work with the sense bar as well, or just the keyboard at the bottom. Well, what is the sense? Um, bar? Uh, the, I think he's asking for the sense instead of the hertz. Uh, uh -huh. He's talking about the, the pinch to zoom thing. The oh, pinch. the pinch to zoom with the sense bar. No, um, no, this is this is fixed size. Okay, but Jordan, actually, there is a feature he has. Frank, could you show on the indicator? how you can actually display the sense at the bottom of the indicator. Yes, yes. As you play that um, note, because I think that's actually what that's, he, that's a cool feature. Get on. Perhaps we should not start with the sense, but with the, uh, with the frequency in Hertz. Because okay. by default, I only show this for, for the, the concert pitch. Oh no, let me go back to the indicator settings. Uh, Settings, let's just reset them. So, there you see, I'm attaching the actually current frequency to the indicator. Okay. You see, am, I, for, am I misremembering that that could also be changed to attach the sense to it? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, okay, you can do both. Um, I, I show you and you go to indicator and you have the textual pitch display yep. and you see frequency only for concert pitch and you can say okay for concert pitch I want to have the frequency and for all other notes yeah. I want to have uh, sets. And then, okay so when I'm setting my A uh, I will actually get a 440 hertz indicator and everything and you else. Can even, you can even have both if you want to. Um, you can say, give me always frequency and always sense. Okay. So it's pretty familiar. Yeah. There you go. And this is one of the intuitive ways I'd, I'd want to um, I'd put into a pianoscope because you have multiple frequencies and sense numbers here because you have your tuning target that's up here in the center and you have your current pitch. And in all the other apps, you have labels that say it's current pitch, target pitch, and there 
and it's just too much text and noise for me, I think. And I yeah. made it clear what I put in the center is your target number and what's attached to the moving thing is just your current number. And everybody yeah. immediately understands what that means. Yeah, yeah, nice. Um, I have one more comment from Liz and then we can, if we don't have any other questions, we can move on to the next segment. But Liz, you said you can edit the range of the indicator to be 50 cents or 100 cents if that's helpful. Uh, yeah. if they're wanting a more zoomed in version of the indicator. Um, so Jordan, if that's what you were asking for, uh, there is a, a way to do a yes. setting here that Frank's showing. Um, okay, uh, any other questions about either the indicator or just how you would interface with this while you're tuning um, or pitch raising or things like that? Okay. Uh, let's move on, uh, Frank, to the next segment. Yes. So the next segment is about the simple and clean design. We've already touched it at, uh, at some points. And um, I wanted to uh, stress that we all know that software can become baroque over the years with more and more features added, cluttering the user interface. And uh, when I design software, I follow a principle called progressive disclosure. That means that on its veneer, a software should appear simple and approachable. And once you get more experienced with it, you can discover more and more layers of advanced functionality. And this is what I try to do with Pianoscope. And so don't think that because it looks just simple with a simple scale and nothing around it, that it doesn't have all the, the bells and whistles. Um, they are pretty much well thought out and, and um, covered behind uh, different layers. And um, when talking about advanced features, um, I, I can't cover, cover them all because we would have to do a couple of, of webinars on them. Um, I want to stress uh, that there are devi deviation curves which with you can inspect um, individual tuning intervals. I will show that in a, in a second. And there's a function to optimize for minimal pitch movement. If like you have a piano and you want to choose a concert pitch, which one do you choose? Um, if you want to have the minimal movement for the whole instrument, there's a way to measure this with the piano scope. And um, we already mentioned the automatic overpulling for pitch raising and lowering, and uh, we have uh, non-equal temperaments in there. And um, I can demo a couple of things from this. Um, let's look at deviation curves. Um, let's take the Shigeru Kawai for a start. Um, there, oh, let's start. There's a, a section called tuning curve in the main menu. And if okay. you open that up, um, you let's hide this for a start. You get the tuning curve that a piano scope calculated for this instrument. A tuning mm -hmm. curve shows you how much offset from a harmonic tuning every note has to be stretched to uh, reach your, your nice tuning. And you have a sense scale here and you see that for this instrument, the treble is stretched up to 35 cents and the bass goes down to minus 40, 40.7 cents. This is the tuning curve. You get some wiggles in here. This is because of the jumps in inharmonicity that are pretty, pretty small for this uh, fine instrument. And um, but what about the tuning intervals, about the actual beats you're hearing when you playing intervals? You can uh, show that too. Let's look at octaves. What you're seeing here now is in addition to the tuning curve, you're seeing for every octave interval, like the two one octaves, the four two, the three four, and so on octaves, you see a curve. And this curve shows you that for every note, when you play that interval, how strong will the, the beating for that interval be there that you're hearing and measured in Hertz, like the beating frequency in Hertz. And um, 
The interesting thing about this is um, you also get a color coding. The color coding tells you how strong, how loud this um, beat is in the mix of different um, intervals you're hearing. And uh, for this fine instrument, what you're seeing in the bass, this is what, what's the actual benefit of a large grand piano is that you can get all the beats of all the octaves down below, let's, let's say like 1 uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 hertz. That is actually no beating if there for all the intervals. It's a very, very clean bass you can achieve. Um, let's compare this uh, with a with a different instrument like here uh, P188. That's a small, much smaller um, grand piano. And there you see, look at the the octaves as well, and you see now it's not looking that good anymore. You get more beating. And what what the tuning curve algorithm of Pianoscope does, it it finds a compromise of them. You see, you get a compromise between the 846342 beatings balanced out against the uh, uh, the 105 beats in the bass so this is a very compromised beating sound you get but now now it gets interesting what do we do if our grands get get even smaller what what does happen there let's go to a 162 grand and what you're seeing here is what you as an oral tuner do now you start sacrificing intervals because you can't get even if you if you try to you can't get the beating of the 10 5 interval into a range where it isn't audible you it will be around two hertz 1.5 and you can check that out if i change the tuning style to say i want to rescue that 10 5 interval let's pull this up here you see how the stretch gets even larger but if I do that, I still get a beating of 1.8 Hertz for the 10.5 interval, but I get very, very bad beating out of the others. And this is where, where the, the algorithm, uh, the tuning algorithm of uh, Pianoscope says, I have to sacrifice this, this one interval like you do when you tune orally. It's a matter of sound taste. And um, I, I worked with, uh, to design this tuning curve uh, algorithm, I worked with a Czech uh, master tuner who tuned over 30,000 uh, uh, pianos in his life. And uh, I recorded the, his tuning curves and I tried to match his taste in, in uh, sacrificing these intervals. And uh, let's look at a spinet as the a very small upright what does it look there and you, you, then you see <laughs> the beating and the bass for the 10.5 goes up to eight hertz it's not rescuable at all and at that point i even sacrifice the 8.4 interval so i'm sacrificing two intervals now and if you look at the at the 12s we have them now in green um it's a, pre a similar picture for them like the 9 3 12 you you can't rescue that and so these get sacrificed to make a good sound out, out of the other ones. This is the concept behind the tuning curves in Pianoscope. And even before you start tuning, you can visualize that. What, what can I achieve with that instrument? What, what can I get out of it? Yeah. Uh, earlier, Daniel asked a question about how being an aural tuner, you know, how would he use this uh, in day-to-day -day life? Um, and I think this is a way that it's a really good application of that um you know leading up to the tuning of a section you could easily toggle into this and say okay i'm focusing on my octaves but i really don't like how they sound i just want to quickly get a visual representation of what's going on there um and then you can verify oh yes that thing i'm hearing beating is actually in the eight four or you know in this interval or that uh that partial a coincident partial here and you could actually visualize it and move it around and see visually what the outcome will be if you were to retune it to a different partial um, so this would be a screen as well that you'd probably find that you frequent for the pianos um, yeah. that you uh, work with yes that's that's right and you can even use the deviation curve to get a, an intuition for what does it mean to tune pure 12s against yeah. pure octaves for example yeah. if you 
um, by default, Pianoscope used, uh, uses a balance style, which is like a, a, an average between pure octaves and pure twelfths. And yeah. it, it's a bit stronger to the uh, preferring the twelfths here. And, you, and if you look, the twelfths uh, are the greens, are the green lines. And you see that if you go up to the treble, I, the, the twelfths are pretty much pure up to uh, C6, and then they are sacrificed a bit. But if you switch to pure twelfths, you see, then you nail the twelfths even up to the treble to being pure, but with the result of getting worse octaves you see if you switch between them you can see how these moves or if you want to prefer the octaves with pure octaves you see you're sacrificing the twelves now and you see how this affects your stretch so you can play with that and get a feel what does it mean to to uh, to prefer these intervals yeah and frank if you could reduce this down to just either uh the fifths uh, let's go down to fifths or octaves uh, I actually use this screen just in the conversation of teaching somebody how to orally listen to certain intervals. And instead of spending an hour trying to explain them what coincident partials existed inside an octave, I just told them, hey, go pull this screen up, look at it, now tell me what you see. And they were able to very quickly repeat back to me well, uh, you told me that the 4-2 was a coincident partial, and it looks like it's fading out about this note right here. And I should probably focus on this coincident partial for this section and this coincident partial for that section. They couldn't give me all the ins and outs right away of what all that meant, but mm -hmm. they nailed the practical application of what they should be interpreting in the aural pitch they're listening to very quickly. And it allowed me to just say, yes, now go tune four twos in this area and six threes in this area. And, you know, you can play around with this and get more familiar with this over time. Uh, so it actually shortened the time that I had to spend actually teaching oral concepts um, for intervals. Um, and then same with the fifths. When it came time to tune fifths, it's like, hey, go over to the fifths and look at how they interact. So I found that very helpful just as a teaching tool um, to be able to say, okay, you've got two choices on your fifths, you got the three, two, and then you got this other one that we rarely use um, and because we're not really tuning fifths down in the base. Um, you're gonna tune the fifths in the middle, right? And so I was able to use this visually to just help demonstrate that um, at a high level. And I found it very effective as a teaching tool. Oh, that's great. And you can, uh, if you start tuning, you can even show like the, um, oh, doesn't this work? Let me check it again. No, it doesn't work. Um, in the in the actual release product, it works. You can show the uh, the progression of the thirds. How if you do third tests, how they should progress and which uh, beating speed to expect at a at a certain point. And you can check that if you really get them in your tuning. Um, so this is a a nice way to check this as well. Yeah. Frank, we have a, a question about pitch raising. Can you cover that here quick? Yes, um, we had a question about pitch raising. When we let's let's start a pitch raise. Um, what does it look like? Um, there is a menu item for pitch raising. You just pull that. And as you know, um, if you want to calculate the overpull, you have to know a bit about the instruments. You um, have to know where the highest bass bridge note is. Um, you can either enter this by slider or press this icon and simply play it on the keyboard and it automatically recognizes the note. Um, you tell them where the wound strings are. Uh, um, if your piano has treble struts, it's good to uh, specify their locations because they make the, the soundboard more rigid at that point and around the struts you, you need less overpull and we can account for that. Um, it, there are pianos with a second treble strut. You can add, uh, add that too. You can set overpull limits if you're afraid of breaking strings, like I have an older piano. Um, you can limit the amount of overpull. Um, you can also use the defaults in here. And if you want to and you know, oh, I want less overpull or something more, you can uh, manually adjust that. And once you've done that, if you've just recorded the inharmonicity anyway before, you you can overtake the uh, you can uh, use these me uh, measurements 
take them over. And um, if you have not done that, you have to um, sample the pitch situation of the piano so that we know how much out of tune it is. And I can show that what that looks like with the recorded sound. Sorry, where are we? No, select the wrong note. So, and what you're seeing here is um, I set up the tuning for 440 hertz uh, as a concert pitch and the piano I have on file here has uh, 444. So what we're actually seeing here now is not a pitch raise, but a pitch lower um, that, okay. that I recorded. But you can do that, it's the same concept. You, uh, so this is, um, oh, I have to delete that. You shouldn't be talking. Let's delete that. So let's stop the recording. So um, this is uh, this is the tuning curve for the piano that you want to go to, and you see your actual pitches are far above that. So you you have a pitch lower. And once you've recorded that, you can start. And um, Pianoscope is uh, advising you that you now tune have to tune in order from bottom to top. This is. Uh, the point it, it reminds you to that and now you're in pitch raise mode and um, what's happening is that the scale becomes linear not logarithmic and you don't aim for the zero but for these under pull markers now if you do a pitch raise you will have to over pull now you have to under pull and um, you see if you uh, if you select let's turn off the strobe while i'm talking so if you um, select different nodes, you see that the under pull is calculated dynamically for, for okay, the places yeah. around the struts. And you aim for that, that marker and then you're good. And uh, it turns out that um, people really like the results. Um, they're pretty much on spot for, for most of the pianos out there. Yeah, one, one question we had from Carol, when over pulling, how many notes is it wise to tune before going back and tuning their unisons? Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Frank, but you're expecting uh, just working strings left to right, bottom to yes. top of the piano? You, you tune and the so, unisons as you go. Okay. And then you just let them fall where they fall? Or do you go back? It sounds like they're asking if you ever go back. No, and clean no. up these unison. So, um, okay. Um, so I think the answer, Carol, would be if you got your over pole corrected or under pole corrected uh, properly, you should just be able to go unisons as you go, just grab a mute and just do one string at a time. Um, okay. Uh, another question from somebody Are the deviation curves showing something similar to what Piano Meter does with its tuning styles? I guess piano meter is another um, as app. Far as, as, I know piano, as, as far as I know, piano meter, they, they have a, a similar uh, deviation curves. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, tune, tune Lab has a kind of deviation curve as well. Um, but 
I think what makes Pianoscope special is that, that you are pretty agile to configure that and dive into the data. And it's pretty, pretty approachable. Um, this is what, what I aimed for with them. Yeah. And uh, Josh asks, with a pitch adjustment, is there a setting to measure every note? And if so, is it more accurate to measure them all if you have time? Um, you can do it. You can measure all the notes, but usually if you um, have a, a, a very out of tune piano, uh, in, in a, it's pretty consistent how much the, the, the uh, notes are off. It's not that you have one note that's like 100 cent flat and the, under, the other besides it is 50 cent sharp. If you have the, such a situation, please measure all the notes. But if, if you like have a consistent uh, tuning situation, it's, it's sufficient to measure like, like a triad that I showed you, but you can measure more yeah. if you want to. Yeah, and I mean, 20 years in the field, the times that uh, the piano pitch wise on a pitch raise wasn't relatively consistent in each section. You know, you have 10 block issues or something else where individual notes just were way off, but that was more indicative of a repair that needed to be done, yeah. um, not a properly functioning piano. Um, so I, what I hear you saying is, yes, you can. Yes, but, you can. You can um, measure every note uh, you want to. Yeah. And uh, all the notes you haven't measured are just interpolated to the values, to the neighboring values. So Yeah. Uh, Jordan asks, CyberTuner basically calculates every tuning as an overpull or underpull and closer tunings have little to none that's needed, but is it still calculated? It is still calculated. Is this the same here with Pianoscope or does it start at a certain deviation of pitch? Um, in Pianoscope, it's up to you. You have to decide if, you, if it's worth it for you to do a pitch raise. Um, I, I don't follow the every tuning is a pitch raise concept that, that CyberTuner has. Okay. Uh, and then Landon has a question. Um, let's see here. Let me get Landon's mic on. Hey, Landon, what's your question? Um, hold on one moment. Your mic is muted. I'm asking you to unmute. Okay. Uh, if Landon gets in here. Um, okay. I don't think I can unmute his mic. Uh, no question accidentally pressed. Okay. No worries. Uh, okay. Uh, was there anything else in this section you wanted to cover, Frank? Let's let's uh, look at my notes. Um, yes, um, we could have a look at, at the uh, the feature I told you to estimate uh, the minimal amount of movement uh, to choose a concert pitch which uh, results in the in a minimal movement. Yes. Of pitch, just end the pitch raise. Um, let's go to the instrument setting and we go to concert pitch. And this is the regular picker for the concert pitch. You can either um, manually select it or choose it as a sense of that from 440 hertz. And actually what I'm showing you now is not yet in the released version. It's in an upcoming uh, beta okay. of the, the next version, which will hopefully be released soon. And uh, there's uh, the way a uh, function to measure the concert pitch that you, you uh, get to a piano and you say, let's play it, choose the note, where do I have it? A4. And it, say, it says you 443.17. Four, four, so if you okay. want to keep a concert pitch, you uh, have just measure it and, and you're set in that okay. dialogue. But most of the time um, you want to change something in the pitch and there's this optimize function. What you can do is Pianoscope, like, well, let's stop this because I talked into it. Um, Pianoscope with all things guides you through this process. Um, it tells you to determine the optimal concert pitch. We need an estimate of the current tuning. Please play the red marked notes uh, because I already talked. Um, of the A minor triad. And okay. you can do the same thing with pitch raising. If you have already measured the inharmonicity, the data is already there. You don't have to replay it. Yep. And um, you, 
you do a measurement and in the end a pianoscope calculates an ideal concert pitch for you which results in a minimum a minimal amount of movement for you okay. so you Great. can the amount of notes you sample you can just sample three or four or five notes it's good enough it suggests doing this triad which is pretty quick in 20 seconds you're done and this is a, a nice function for limiting the amount of tuning work you have to do yeah okay great let's um let's move on to voicing and yes. cover that final topic yes let's go to our last topic voicing analysis um uh to be honest voicing is uh a mystery to me um, because I'm not a I'm not a pro. I'm not a piano technician, but I'm always amazed to see how you guys work with needles and glue and chemicals on the felt and wood, and um, it's totally fascinating to me. And uh, I once had a, a, a voicing experience in my living room because my living room has a hard wooden floor and plastered walls, and the resonances there make make it sound very harsh. And uh, I had a piano technician uh, coming to my house and kneeling on my piano. And it was such a beautiful balanced sounds afterwards uh, that I said, oh, that's magic. What, what, what he's doing there? And um, was it was a bliss for me to to see that. Um, that said, as I've observed, voicing is not a mystery if you have uh, great oral skills that you know what, what you're actually changing with, with voicing. What partials are you, you uh, taking out or putting into the picture? And um, so unless you have strong oral skills, voicing remains a mystery or unless you have pianoscope because it helps you to, to, to learn those. And actually, um, We've already seen that. We've already seen the partials in action that how Pianos gives, gives you uh, real-time feedback and um, we can have a small demo. I, actually, I won't needle any hammers now, um, <laughs> but I can show you a small, where's my iPhone? There's my iPhone. Let's bring up the partial spectrum again and make the keyboard a bit smaller so that we have room for the partials. And uh, I've recorded my uh, own piano and it currently has a small voicing problem around C5. And let's check if we can spot it with uh, Pianoscope. I show you C5 and let's put it into Maxim. Ah, sorry, I've lowered the pitch too much. So we currently see an even progression of the partials, pretty much strong first part. Oh, I'm, I'm talking into that. Let's freeze it to C5. We've seen that. Let's go to to C sharp. Just go along with. Literally start that. Don't know what's happening here. No, it's not picking up any sound. Let me switch to the iPad instead. I don't know what the simulator is doing. Uh, let's go to partial spectrum. So this is the linear progression. Go to C sharp. And 
And there you see that the first partial is much, much weaker than the others compared to the neighboring notes. So when you play a scale, you definitely hear a difference there. And once we go to D5, you say you have a linear progression there again. So hmm. you've singled out the C sharp five between those two as sticking out as a, as a, as a special note. This is um, an information you can get out it's pretty easy if you have the uh, the device on the piano and you repeatedly play the notes it's easier than with my sample player here um and this is the the kind of information you can get out uh, for for doing voicing analysis and if you uh, work on the on the hammer and you compare it uh, afterwards uh, you get uh, get the feeling for it you don't have to use the maximum mode. You can also look at how the, the, the partials progress over time in the sound. Then you switch to the continuous mode and uh, compare them. So this is the, the, the kind of information you can get out uh, for, for voicing analysis. Yeah, and um, uh, Liz says a large part of voicing is the bloom of the note that happens beyond the initial one second that you focused on for the tuning. Uh, and the way to visualize that, Liz, is to put the partials in continuous mode, uh, yes. like Frank just demonstrated, because you can actually watch the partials over time um, as that bloom happens and decays um, and watch what happens with individual partials as they increase and decrease over time. We can, uh, we can watch it for a bass note, for example. Yep. And uh, sorry, I'm trying not to talk, but I just overdid it. Yeah, sure. um, anyway, but you could actually see as the note bloomed and decayed, uh, I think it was the fifth partial was lower and then became higher. And then the second or third partial just completely dropped out through the floor. Um, after about a second and a half to two seconds um, of that note playing. So um, all that information is actually really helpful. Uh, pianists and piano owners love it because they actually can understand voicing in a way that's more than just you trying to use words to explain this invisible thing that's really complex. Um, and you, you know, it's a lot easier to sell voicing jobs if you can just say, look, this note, this note, this note behave properly, but this C sharp five, like Frank was showing, um, you know, the reason that note sounds weak is because that first partial isn't voiced properly. You know, maybe there's a hammer issue, a mating issue, whatever, but that's where you get to be the hero uh, and get to diagnose what the problem is and actually fix the problem. Um, and so I think you'll find that tool helpful, both in demonstrating and selling voicing jobs uh, to customers and just educating them and helping them understand the value that they got out of paying you to sit there and do a voicing on their piano. Um, so uh, a, couple, a couple of questions here, Frank, just general about Pianoscope. If you purchase Pianoscope on iOS, is it available on all your Apple devices? Yes, um, this is a standard uh, Apple policy. You can use it on up to five personal okay. devices. So, okay. Uh, Gideon, uh, I think that and the, and the good thing is because um, the documents of pianoscopes um, are simple files, you can simply put them on iCloud Drive and they sync between all your devices. So you have all the, the files uh, with, without any work on all your devices. Yeah, uh, Brent just had a comment there that he really likes the tuning curve feature and the quick partial analysis that can be done. Um, and also just seconding what we were talking about earlier, where it's hard to switch between the right and left side of your brain, aural tuning versus visual ETD analysis. Um, and so anyway, but he really likes how all of this functions to be able to just see it so that as he's aurally tuning or working with it, you know, I think Brent, you'll find that you, um, you, you find the piano scope both agrees with a lot of what you're seeing. Um, and just gives you more information to be able to make better decisions on that front too. So, um, all right. Well, Frank, I think there were a few other things. You've got a promo code to share with folks and yes, I'll uh, let, let you me, just kind of tie this off and we'll let me go wrap this back up. To if the, there's any other the, questions, to the slides. Feel free to pop them in and we'll try to get to them before the end. 
Yeah, just just wrap it up for uh, for a bit. Um, we've learned that with Pianoscope, you can build better oral skills. Um, you can understand what's going behind the scenes of your ETD. Um, you don't have to trust it blindly. Um, and it's a whole new world that's there to discover for you. And it can make you more satisfied, make your clients happy and give you give you more confidence when you walk into a client's home. And um, this is what what are what we're aiming for. And um, the good news is uh, you can try it out for free. Uh, check it out if you like it. There are no strings attached <laughs> uh, to uh, to the app. You can start the the, the free forty day trial. It expires on its own. There's no no payments needed for it. Um, and uh, go to the website pianoscope.app and just click the download button and you should be good to go um, if you really like it and you want to keep on working with it um, there are two pricing models um, you can either do a one-time purchase or very affordable you can do a subscription a monthly subscription that's great for for uh, people starting off with piano tuning just to do, do a monthly payment and um, for you guys in, in, in the webinar, I have a special offer. If you do a, a, a yearly subscription, I can send you a code which gives you a 50% off the first year. And uh, just write to me at, uh, oops, at this email address, frank at pianoscope.app, and I can send you an individual code that you can redeem in the App Store. Yeah. Well, we've got a little bit of time here for some extra Q&A. Uh, one comment, Frank, going back to the voicing that I missed. Uh, somebody asked, for voicing, is the quality of the bar heights going to be compromised by a low quality microphone? And how do they compare to what we're hearing, actually hearing with our ears? It's a great question. Yes, the actual height I think the actual height of the bars uh, is dependent on the, the response curve of the microphone. Okay. And the, the microphones in, in, uh, in an iPhone are not perfectly linear. It depends on the, on the part you are voicing. Um, the most non-linearity is in the, in the low bass. Okay. Um, if that's not of your concern, it's okay, but I think actually for voicing, it's not of your problem if you have like minute differences in the bars. It's it's like the great differences and the whole dynamic in that. And I think that's not dependent on the quality of the microphone because yeah. they're good enough for that. Yeah, okay. And if honestly, the, the biggest problems with the mic issues is in the low bass, um, almost all of the voicing I've dealt with comes, the problem spots come high up the piano and in the mid range um more so than the low low bass but um yeah uh good good question though um i've got two kind of related um uh questions one from tom saying that it would just be nice if there was a picture of a client's piano uh function in the feature so that he could remember how the piano looks when he's searching in the piano files Okay. Uh, and then Jordan is asking if it's possible to make a way to save the piano file with Gazelle, since Gazelle creates a record for each individual piano, it could be a handy way to toggle between the two. Um, so on those two things, Jordan, yes, we are exploring these possibilities. Um, and I mean, we're open to integrating with any app, uh, any tuning app anybody's using, but to be honest, to date, it just hasn't been as a viable function from a development standpoint. Um, but that is something that we're exploring with Frank with Pianoscope. Um, if enough people are asking for that, um, then we're going to look into doing that for sure. Um, just to make it easier from when you're taking notes in Gazelle's piano file to toggle into the tuning file that you've got saved for that piano in Pianoscope. Uh, what that looks like, we're still not sure, but we're exploring it. Um, and then Tom, also, if you do use Gazelle, uh, you can snap that picture in there. And then if we do do that integration, e even if Frank doesn't do that feature uh, to hook into the microphone, we'd be able to uh, simulate that a little bit. But Frank, is that something you've considered just hooking into the camera on the... Uh, it's, the it's the first time I've got that request, but it, it totally makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I could totally understand that. Um, okay. Um, all right. Uh, if there are any other questions, quick, are the mic input levels adjustable? 
Um, that's um, all. Actually, I'm using the automatic uh, microphone adjustment that's in the iPhone. So it okay. does automatic gain. It doesn't matter if you put the phone further away, it adjusts, automatically adjusts. Okay. I don't have a manual gain setting. It, yeah, uh, yeah. Works, yeah, but works. you can manually change the mic settings for your iPhone if you want, um, correct? Uh, no, actually, you don't. Uh, I don't have oh. a manual switch, but it's automatic, and I haven't found any situation where you ha would have to, to change it. Okay. All right. Sorry, I was thinking iPhone allowed you to do that independent of your app, but if it's not going to affect it and the automatic works fine, um, that shouldn't be an issue, Landon. Um, okay, well, everybody, thank you so much. We're going to make a recording of this and send it to everybody if you want to revisit anything. And then if you have any questions for Frank, uh, pianoscope.app. Uh, and then also, if you want 50% off on your first year for you using this, um, take advantage of that. Uh, we're really excited to introduce you to Pianoscope and Frank. It's been a lot of fun getting to know him. Frank, thank you so much for your time this evening. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time to just tell us about Pianoscope to share your story. Uh, it was fascinating just getting to hear what your experience was like on the other side of our customers. You know, we, we dealt with COVID and the lockdowns in one way. And, um, you know, a lot of our customers felt exactly like you expressed. So thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, everybody, we hope you have a good evening. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. We hope you enjoyed the special edition of the Gazelle School of Business, and I think you can see why we are excited to introduce you to Pianoscope. Uh, if you have any other questions about Gazelle or Gazelle School of Business, you can go to growwithgazelle.com forward slash school, where you can see videos on every topic you can imagine related to building and running a piano service business. Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you in another video.